Welcome to the broadcast, everybody. My Manhattan tiara is having its first airing. I think it's the first time I've worn it on a broadcast. Can't quite remember, but I did showcase it for you in the previous Tip Jar Corner. And we have another Tip Jar Corner today for those of you who are fans at the end of the broadcast. I will put the timestamp for Tip Jar Corner in the box below so you can head straight there if you want to skip today's broadcast, which is going to be rather heavy because it's going to be focusing on Harry and the issues surrounding Africa that have been emerging over the past week. So you have been warned, but we will begin. Actually, I want to begin with a little rant, if you don't mind, a little moan about makeup artists in department stores, or should I say the makeup sales girls. Actually, it's not against the sales girls or boys. It is actually about the culture of shopping. I mean, it's enough, isn't it, when you go in now and you have to serve yourself most of the time because there's not enough staff for all the tills and uh, they demand uh, various bits of information from you and data. More and more people are asking you to sign up for things and it's becoming a cashless society. And yes, I know I sound like a funny duddy, but this is my platform and I want to whinge about it. Well, today's thing I want to whinge about was that I had been in Boots yesterday, Boots the Chemist, and I was waiting for someone on board. So I tried out a little about, bit of foundation. It was an Estee Lauder one, which I don't usually wear because it's subtly fragrance. It's got a bit of sunscreen in it. It's their sheer double wear version. I tried that on the back of my hand and uh, I thought, actually, I quite like that shade. I might pop into a department store the following day and get a sample because they dish out samples all over the place, don't they? Went into one this morning, a department store, went to the Estee Lauder counter and uh, well, first of all, she insisted, absolutely insisted. I couldn't find, I don't know how I found myself winding up sitting in a chair, having my face scanned so that she could find the right shade for me. I already told her the shade that I'd tried on the back of my hand and liked. And she said, well, it's no good trying on the back of your hand. It's different on the face, which is true. I get that. But as I tried to explain without wanting to be totally arrogant, I'm perfectly au fait with the makeup shades that suit me. I've been applying them since I was four years old, virtually still in nappies, my dear. I can do it very easily, but she was convinced that I'd chosen the wrong sh shade. So she planted me in front of this uh, computer thing uh, to find out what would suit my natural colouring. I don't quite understand how they can do that when there were two strips of spotlights either side of you shining onto your face. Yes, they need to see what's going on, but that completely bleaches out and blanches your own skin tones anyway. So how they find your own skin tone under unnatural light, I'm not sure. But I was there and she's moving closer, moving closer. And you know what it's like, my dear. I don't know what they're doing with my information. I don't know what they're doing with my face and my identity. And I'm sure absolutely nothing. But one doesn't know, does one? And I just found myself there thinking, how did this happen? I'm a fairly strong, confident person. I don't want this. But she was quite insistent. And then, before she issued me the sample, which used to be a simple affair and encourage good business, before she issued me the sample, it ended up being a colour that I didn't want. And I knew what was right for me. She was wrong. But before she even issued me with that sample in the little pot to take away, she demanded my email address. I said, well, I don't want to go on your email list, your marketing list. Uh, oh, no, no marketing, no marketing at all. There's not going to be anything like that at all. We just need it so that I can issue the sample so that we have your shade stored of what we've issued to you. She went into this great big tire tribe and I almost found myself getting bullied into doing it. But I did eventually pipe up and said, no, I don't, I'd rather not, if, if, even if it means going away without the sample. And I've got to tell you, there was quite a battle of wills going on between us and she became quite frosty. And I just thought, how dare you? And she said, and I ended up saying, well, listen, my dear, I'm afraid things have got to change and the industry's got to change because this is not customer service and it's not fostering any sort of goodwill towards you. We just want to sit here and play. I know exactly what I'm talking about when it comes to me. I just want to take away a pot so that I can try it overnight and then it might come back if I enjoy it and give you my customer. Well, that's not going to happen now, my dear, because uh, I'm not giving you my personal data and you don't need it. And she sort of, well, she didn't apologize, 
But she said, well, that is, you know, I have to do this. I have to say it. And I said, look, I understand. I said, you, you know your stuff, some of it. You know your stuff, but, and I understand that is what you've got to do. But I'm afraid the industry needs a shake up and you need to put customers first again, rather than making us feel uncomfortable, demanding our email, demanding our faces are scanned. All I need is a pot of cosmetics, a tiny little sample. You know, a little bit of face paint to daub overnight. Is it really necessary? And do you really think that this is going to foster goodwill between custom and client? Client, I don't think so. Well, I'm sorry to make a fuss of it, my dear, but I'm bringing it up just to urge those of you who might not have the confidence to do so. And as I say, I found myself bullied into a seat having my photo taken. Say no and don't be ashamed about it. And don't be ashamed or backwards in coming forwards to tell them that this is not on and it's not cricket and you won't stand for it. And if they're not willing to just provide you a sample, you'll take your business elsewhere. I feel some type of way about it, I'm afraid. And companies need to start putting clients and customers first. And it's certainly not just Estee Lauder happened to be in this instance, but I will not be shopping at Estee Lauder again. And moreover, I didn't like the foundation anyway. I didn't like it anyway. It has sunscreen in it, which I don't like. And it has this glowy effect. And I don't like glowy skin. And it doesn't settle in the pores well. So I'm glad I didn't just make the purchase outright. I like totally invisible sheer makeup if I'm going to wear any at all. Uh, in casual circumstances. Totally undetectable. Is it undetectable or indetectable? It's a real bugbear of mine, you know. If anyone was to ever say to me, oh, I love your foundation, uh, what do you use? I'm talking in day-to-day -day life, not on the broadcast. What do you use? What kind of makeup? I would be absent. That would be an affrontery to me, my dear. They should have no idea whatsoever that the foundation has anything to do with it. But if they compliment well and say, oh, your skin looks divine. What's your secret? Well, that's a horse of a different color. And that's a wonderful thing. Queen Camilla spent a spell of time in Cambridge at the Meadows Community Centre and she was watching dancers from Strictly Come Dancing, which is our British version of Dancing with the Stars. I think it was the, actually the original version of that kind of series. And some contestants from Love Island who were leading dance classes for beginners. It looked like such jolly fun. And we find out that Camilla was a big fan of the show and she said that they all watch it. <laughs> I could just imagine them settling down in their slippers and she was gifted a pair of dancing shoes and she also met with Royal Voluntary Service volunteers at this newly opened community centre. Part of me wishes that she had been made to join in, <laughs> but on second thoughts perhaps that might not have been the best idea, or especially a royal and befitting of a queen. We'll leave the dancing to the likes of Catherine and Sophie at the moment, shall we, my dears? But now we are going to turn to a slightly more serious issue and uh, it has emerged this story over the past week or so and I haven't addressed it so far but I will be doing so now and uh, this is mainly for those of you who don't know much about this story and who want the backstory and also want to hear how it ties in with Harry's relationship with William and the sort of tension between them according to palace insiders and sources who have spoken to the Times. Claims have been made in the Times, the British newspaper the Times, that the seeds of William and Harry's feud were sown in their approach to conservation work. And this is where a lot of the drama began unfolding. It's Kate Mancy and Jane Flanagan who have written an article and who have spoken with palace aides and other sources who are involved with the palace. And this comes in the wake of a report in the Mail on Sunday, actually, that revealed that African rangers who are paid by African parks of which Prince Harry is on the board of directors, by the way. He was promoted last year after six years as a president. He's been promoted on the board of directors. And African Parks, if you don't know, is a non-profit conservation organisation that's responsible for the rehabilitation and management of national parks in partnership with governments and communities over 12 countries and 50 million acres from Angola to Zimbabwe. And the allegations that have been made against African parks involve the African rangers of these parks and their mistreatment of certain peoples. And while we are discussing this, I'm going to be using the word assault 
instead of the word that sounds like grape. But if you deduct the first letter from that word, you will understand what I'm talking about, how serious it is. But I'm going to substitute that for the word assault for the purposes of the fact that this is YouTube. The Rangers are accused of assaulting and beating indigenous people who are living in rainforests in Central Africa. And the horrors and violence and wickedness that has been alleged is grim reading, I've got to tell you, grim reading. And suffice to say, by the way, I'm absolutely sure that the Duke of Sussex is equally as horrified as all of us to learn this. So let it be known that I'm not casting any other sort of aspersion when it comes to that. But another group from Africa called Survival International have come forward. And by the way, they were big fans of Prince Harry, by the way, for quite some time, not so much now. And they are a group who fight for the rights of indigenous people. Well, it seems that they wrote to the Duke and Duchess of Sussex last year, the 31st of May, 2023, and they asked Harry to use his influence and his position to stop these abuses being committed. Harry did respond to them, to his credit, and he responded fairly quickly early in June. And he, he told them that he had escalated the concerns to the CEO and the chairman of African Parks and said that they would be the appropriate people to handle next steps. And there is the possibility, by the way, that his recent promotion with African Parks from what was formerly only a ceremonial kind of role to a slightly more active executive one, I suppose you could say, last year. It could have been, we have to consider the possibility, it could have been a reaction to the letter, uh, stepping up to enable him to become more involved. But Survival International are not seeing it that way and are calling for him to stand down. But regardless of the motive, Harry's new appointment has enraged them and they are lobbying for him to quit African Parks in support of the alleged victims. The campaign director at Survival International told Newsweek, the level of atrocities we were documenting was such that we decided to approach Prince Harry directly and we wrote a letter at the end of May. Harry replied just after on the 12th of June, telling us that he'll escalate this to the CEO of African Parks, who then contacted us, basically asking us to do his job, asking us for more details. And all of these nasty allegations centre on the mistreatment of the Baka people, the indigenous group of hunter-gatherers who historically used an area of one of the national parks of the Republic of Congo for their food. They were formerly known as pygmies. And it's alleged that as well as beatings and assaults and all kinds of nastiness, some of these rangers have been evicting the Baka people, effectively starving them and forcing them to return to this hostile environment, which was ancestrally and historically theirs. The lady who is the campaign director at Survivor International says that she felt positive about Harry's response coming through so quickly initially and she says he seems like he really cares about the issue and was worried, which, which I'm sure he was. But then she says when he joined the board of directors, that is the legal representative body. It has governance of the organisation. And so she says that her, her peers began to ask themselves why, why had he done this? Because they had just told him of the human rights abuses and the CEO, they say, had not been helpful. And so that is when they decided to go public. She said, as someone who has taken a high profile stand against racism, the prince could help to bring about real change for indigenous people. And I wonder if Harry and Meghan are all aghast and clutching their pearls at this lady from Survival International intimating the fact that racism is at play between various peoples and groups of Africa itself. Because Harry and Meghan, with all the accusations of racism, bigotry and unconscious bias, seem to be of that sort of kinfolk who think that racism only exists white against black. Uh, no, it is not just white against black, my dear. And it takes an ignoramus to think along those lines. Racism is any race 
against any race. Full stop, period. It is not one colour against another. It is not a one-way street. That would be colourism, and colourism is only really a thing amongst non-white communities. So go figure. African Parks is funded by a consortium of bodies such as the EU, the US government, wealthy ph philanthropists, the kind that Harkles adore, and also a little bit of British aid thrown in. African Parks say that the allegations of misconduct are thoroughly investigated, and they say that we immediately launched an investigation through an external law firm based on the information we had available, while also urging Survival International to provide any and all facts they had. It's unfortunate that they have decided not to cooperate despite repeated requests, and we continue to ask for their assistance. So it's important for us to consider both ends of the lollipop, isn't it, my dears? And I am doing that. But then there was a further rebuttal from Survival International saying that they had told African Parks about these abuses that had sprang up a long time ago, 10 years ago, around about 2013-14. Uh, they'd told them about various incidents. It seems like this was some sort of brewing issue. And uh, they also say that African Parks are the ones with immense resources. They're the ones that wield all this power and have all this money incoming whereas they do not. So that's why they're saying, you know, don't put this on us to do all your job for you. And Survival International went on to say, we hope Harry will act as the human rights campaigner he is supposed to be. Harry talks about social justice. <laughs> yes, he does, doesn't he? He acts on and on and on about it. So does the wife. But he has spoken out about racism in the past. Yeah, well, that was a lie, lover girl. That was a lie as the penny might have dropped over the last few years for you, as it did for the rest of the world, my dear. That was a downright lie. And in fact, according to Harry, he didn't even say it. He didn't even claim he was talking about racism. <laughs> well, you heard what we heard. He is now in the world of directors, this lady continues to say. He's now in the world of directors. When you give your name to an organisation, you are part of that organisation. You have a duty to act if there are human rights abuses going on. Well, what seems to be coming to light now is the tone of how William and Harry's disagreements, going back years now to when they worked together at charitable foundations, might have foreshadowed some of the dangers of the strategy of African parks that we see today. The Royal Foundation was originally founded by William and Harry in 2009, and I'd actually forgotten this myself, but it was called originally the Foundation of Prince William and Prince Harry as a vehicle for their charitable ambitions. And we are told by insiders that they were actually at odds over the best way to reduce poaching and to save the endangered species of Africa. And a well-placed source, says the Times, who knows both William and Harry personally, said they're both very passionate about saving protected species, but didn't always share the same view about how to run projects in Africa. William believes you should focus on community-led schemes where local people over time feel empowered to protect the land. Harry, on the other hand, was more interventionist. He felt that you need a more hands-on approach to ensure wildlife habitats were securely protected to enact change quickly. And they make the point that William's approach was not without its dangers, not at all. So nobody is suggesting one way is perfect and the other isn't. For example, William's good friend, Anton Zimba, was a ranger in the, one of the national parks there, the Kruger Parks, and he was shot and killed. So nobody's saying that his approach was flawless. Not that he was responsible for that, but you get my drift. However, the very, very firm-handed strategy that Harry favours requires big, fat donations relentlessly, ceaselessly coming in from the West. And this 
is what has fueled tensions with local communities who have been cut off from their ancestral and ancient grazing and herding roots. Even Harry himself told us in spare, one day we almost came to blows in front of our childhood mates. Apparently friends of the two asked why they both work on Africa together and William had responded because rhinos and elephants are mine, basically saying, you know, hands off the rhinos and the elephants question, that is under my demise. But then Harry went on to spend three weeks in Malawi relocating 500 elephants. Well, it seems that William had warned him off of the elephant subject, but he wanted to go ahead and do his own thing. And this was one of the most ambitious conservation projects in history. And when the project came to an end, there were some who sensed a jab from Harry at William's expense, at William's approach, which differed from Harry's. They sensed a jab in Harry's words, which fly in the face of William's philosophy, you see, because Harry said, to allow the coexistence of people and animals, fences are increasingly having to be used to separate the two and try to keep the peace. Once a fence is up, you are now managing a parcel of land. Different rules have to apply whether we like it or not. Under these conditions, human intervention in stabilising nature might be required by park managers. So in some quarters, this was seen as a little bit of an F you to William and told you so, you know, do things my way, the Harry way. But the situation in Africa is very complex. It is intricately complex on the ground and African Parks operates on donations of a hundred million dollars per annum. A hundred million. You know, it covers a vast territory. It needs a lot of wonga coming in. And this has led to a blurring of the lines between conflict and conservation. And the force of rangers overseeing some of these parks are often better remunerated and equipped than the local armies. Uh, so much so that actually their defence of endangered species from Islamist militants, for example, and the anti-poaching units that they employ have been compared to a counter-terrorism force of its own. And this is what has sometimes resulted in violent conflicts and killings between rangers and militants. There was even some bombings involved in this. And there's also been insurrections involving some of those guards who have been running amok and running against African Park's own senior staff. There have been incidents of real calamity. And a former member of African Park's management team has come forward to question Harry's suitability for a governance role. Yes, this is a former member of that management team. Now, I should say here that Prince Harry is unpaid for this role. He receives no money for it. So on, I suppose from one angle you could say it is to be admired that he invests his time into this enterprise. But, and there is a big but, it also affords him the opportunity to mix with the world's richest philanthropists, some of them at least. It gives him that soft power that he desperately needs to cling to, so that he is viewed as a prince rather than some former coloniser. <laughs> it's the soft power, you see. It gets him mixing with the Waltons, not Jim Bob, <laughs> and um, Peggy Sue or whatever they were called, my dear, up on the mountain. But you know, the, the, Wal the Waltons that founded Walmart and uh, various Swiss billionaires tycoons, if you will, and even the Oppenheimers who were involved in the South African mines, weren't they? And the diamond mining industry. It gets them all mixing and hobnobbing with them and feeling part of their crowd and their crew. So do you see it does come with its own rewards? One couldn't say that it is true altruism. But this former member of the management team of African Parks has come forward to say Harry has neither the tools, <laughs> that's why they call him Little Taj. Harry has neither the tools, like Big Willy, neither the tools nor the experience to navigate his way through such crises. 
and they back demands for him to step down, basically saying that he's inadequate, inexperienced, doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. Others accuse his rising to a position of greater influence as green colonialism. Half the board are white and there's only one woman. Empire 3.0, Harry. Well, let's see how this story evolves over the next few weeks and months. I'm sure Harry is hurriedly beavering away behind the scenes to try and get some sort of resolution. Well, he needs to step up to the plate, doesn't he, and get on it. But for now, it's time for us to move through the wardrobe, move those fur stoles aside and those dusty cobwebs into a Narnia of our own dreams. And that Narnia is Tip Jar Corner. Welcome to Tip Jar Corner and firstly may I thank any of you most sincerely if you send a tip jar treat my way for a cup of tea or a trinket or to put towards my funds for charity shop finds to help decorate me and the, the scenery. You know last year 2023 I delivered precisely 150 broadcasts. Uh, 150 it's not bad going is it and uh, I did try to bring a different look to every single one of them the VAR I would say over 95% of them brought a new costume if you will usually sourced from a charity shop second hand like this one I've never worn this one before you can't really see it uh, that well I'm afraid because the, the throne behind me is a, a similar color this is actually a gorgeous velvety midnight blue with lovely dusting of sparkles on it really gorgeous and it just fit beautifully. It's got this sort of uh, diaphanous mesh here with the collar. I love it. it. Makes me feel very chic, I've got to tell you. But you know, I rarely wear these things twice, uh, but I do save a lot of them in case I want to rewear them and restyle them. And if I don't wear them again, they go back to the charity shop. So it's a double whammy for charity. And it, it really brings a sense of fun to it for me, I've got to tell you. It help, helps me engage and be creative. Oh, how can I dress it up this time? How can I amuse my fruits and bring a bit of twinkle? Do you see what I mean, my dear? So it's a little bit of fancy dress fun. The fancy dressing up box was always my first love. Uh, today we are focusing on some bric-brac that I found, bric-a-brac, and a few gems, a few vintage uh, but no books this time. I'll try and do some books in, in the, another one during the month, but um, bric-a-brac mainly this time and bits and bobs. Uh, one of my favourite finds actually with this pale blue brooch. The most exquisite, the most delicate blue. So pale and powdery. Enamel on gold, the most gorgeous shade and it's elegantly flecked with antique to golden dusting like golden icing sugar just delicately surrounding the petals that form a beautiful shape don't they and the light dances upon them as one moves around it was seven pounds just seven pounds and it came to me in this box with the brand past times but i don't think that it actually originally came from this brand because it doesn't quite fit in the box very comfortably so I'm not sure of its origin but I wanted to showcase it next to my delicious raspberry ripple brooch that I already possess because I thought they look rather gorgeous together but isn't it absolutely charming I'm looking forward to wearing that and I promised you a close-up of the fruit basket that I acquired <laughs> oh I've got to tell you, I think it is absolutely hideous. I can't pretend that I think it's a thing of beauty, but it did make me grin as soon as I saw it. And I thought immediately of my basketeers, of course. So I had to have it and it features a woven basket. It was eight pounds, by the way, did I mention that? A woven basket uh, and it's a cornucopia of fruit, including purple grapes, bananas, strawberries, apples, limes and cherries. And it's gay and it's brash and invokes the spirit of Carmen Miranda and Anne-Marie Dubna or Dubnay said, love the fruit basket. Fruit baskets always remind me of Carmen Miranda, who I've discussed before, by the way. Your basket is even shaped like some of her exotic headdresses. May the joy of the tropics chase out all the winter blues. 
I am in rainy California currently and the image of your basket and recollections of Carmen Miranda. Ay, 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 I like you very much. Cheered me up. Thank you. Well, that's what it's all about, my dear, isn't it? Sometimes it just brings a smile. And somehow, an old tacky fruit basket can do just that. Ha! <laughs> I'm trying to balance this ornament on my head, which probably is not the best idea in the world. But one day, one day, I will surprise you and I will come to you with a full Carmen Miranda, shall I? and find some fruit to adorn my head. Yes, well, that'll be a challenge. And next is this pretty blue jug. I thought it was a rather attractive shape and I thought it would be useful storing pens or pencils in on a bureau, on a desk, in an office, that kind of thing. Quite sweet. And it is handmade and it is handcrafted by Gwili Pottery, G-W-I-L-I. Uh, in Carmarthen and I looked up some of their similar pieces online. I think they go for about 40 quid usually in that sort of ballpark. I picked this up for one pound. So how can you complain? <laughs> one pound. Uh, if it was my personal choice, I might have left out the white dots all over it and just left the blue because I love the, the blue sort of translucent looking leaves together with some murky greens. It gives a sort of underwater effect, if you will, but I'm rather pleased with it. And then there was this heart-shaped trinket box, which has stolen my heart. Oh, I fell in love with this piece. It's cosy, wonderful for a guest bedroom, I fancy, and it's got a slight chintzy vibe about it, as you can see, but it puts me in heaven. This sort of creamy white and the pinks, it takes me back somewhere nostalgic. And I go through phases with pink, Sometimes I can embrace it, sometimes I find it suffocating and a bit claustrophobic and a bit overwhelming, but in a nice cream room, rather like an ice cream, you know, it's nice to have soothing luscious tones of soft raspberry sorbet and a few delicate greens as well as we have here. This sort of piece adds a romance and an intimacy to a boudoir, a powder room or a chamber and it's practical too. You can keep things in there such as matches for candles for your guest or safety pins or condoms. Now this is one that got me and I'm not quite sure it did and I'm not quite sure why I paid £10.25 for it. It was in a glass cabinet in a charity shop concealed away. I asked the man to get it out, uh, not his penis, this, uh, this thing, you know. I asked him to get it out and uh, then I didn't have the heart to put it back in there and say no. Uh, it's not as weighty as I thought it would. It's quite light. It's brass, it's brass ashtray. They called it antique on the label and they said it was circa 1890, early 1900s. That's what they suggested. And I call it a piece of junk, but it's got a little bit of charm about it, if I do say so myself. And I thought maybe if I clean it up a bit, it'll be a gleam a little bit more. And I can use it as an outdoor ashtray, for example. I can use it as a candle stand for shrapnel, you know, the odd coin here and there. And it's a simple circle in a square with modest embellishment. And I think that actually, even if it does look a bit cheap and tacky in daylight, I think that it will look sublime under candlelight once I've got it scrubbed up and gleaming a bit. Yes, I do think it'll look quite chic. A chiffon scarf in corally pink. Can't really say much else about it other than that, really, can I? What can I say? It's a chiffon scarf. The colour, the shade, rather gives me 60s vibes, would you say, or early 70s. I can imagine wearing it all black or all white with this around the throat and perhaps matching sunnies for a sort of Bieber vibe. I don't know, along those kind of lines, my dear, but I couldn't resist it. I just loved the colour of it. It was pure joy, um, a fondant fancy. I think it's romantic and also I think it could be very alluring in the bedroom. And this is a tip for all of you ladies that I've found to work beautifully if one is naked in the bedroom and perhaps you've just got on a pair of mules on the feet, some fluffy mules but not much else and you want to, you know, wander around the room from the bed to the chaise or to the balcony, you don't really want to get dressed and her gown's too heavy. Uh, a length of chiffon 
in various different states can be wonderfully seductive and nothing is finer than parading around with this draped over your shoulder or as a sarong or just over your bits you know your personal bits my dear just gently concealing them as if you're making the effort but not really uh, this sort of diaphanous translucency uh, especially if there's a lovely breeze on the balcony and you're covering yourself with your chiffon your imagination is the limit my dear but it will drive your stud wild with desire wild with desire it looks wonderful gently clinging to the silhouette of a nice ass. lots of earrings coming up now and this is the only pair of vintage earrings on parade today and yes i am going to sterilize them with alcohol purple tassels on a gold stud they're theatrical and rather silly they were going cheap at the charity shop so i had to have them and i'm going to go to a particular vintage fair over the next few weeks which i think will yield some good vintage or antique ear pieces but they are a little bit more difficult to find for you know a decent reasonable price my dear but in the meantime i am going to make do with a few very common budget finds because i'm new to earrings in two ears I, i've had this ear pierced previously and I had my nose pierced previously but I never had them both down at the same time the ears for some reason and I can't think why but I'm rather new um, so I've got a few unfulfilled fantasies that I want to play out I do uh, so I want to bolster my initial collection without spending basically without spending too much and I will accumulate more vintage earrings over time you know it takes a while to discover these things and to source them so i will start with a haul <laughs> which is the antithesis of glamour from claire's i believe previously known as claire's accessories <laughs> yes and i these are actually my favorite of the entire haul you will see today out of every single item i've shown you these lollipop earrings that i think were well five or six quid something like that four quid because they are i'm indulging my six-year-old girl at a birthday party fantasy my dear i just adore the silliness of these it's that birthday party fantasy hook earrings with glimmering metallic pinks minty greens and golden yellow sticks i just think it's, it's luscious and they drive the gentlemen wild my dear you find them with their tongues hanging out begging to give you a lick and who am i to deny them these are some simple diamante crosses again from claire's as you've seen i've got a few necklaces which match very well with that so they almost become a perure and now we have a selection from primani otherwise known as primark my dears these were just some basic studs that I picked up because there was 24 of them for two pounds. So who can argue with that? But they are just strictly for emergencies. If I need something basic like that. And then I had these clear and shiny beads and crystal effect earrings also from Primark. Nothing much to say about them. Just in case I want to dress up a look. And then there was this pearl headband which was very simple and I wore that in the last broadcast because I was wearing a simple outfit that floral outfit which had a wholesome look to it so I, this just happened to correspond very nicely and match up also at Primark they do a range by Rita Ora and that range is all reduced at the moment or it was where I saw it and so I picked up this Diamante crystal tie for a few quid because I thought it might come in useful and add a bit of pizzazz to an otherwise drab outfit and then to finish off is this haul from john lewis and it was such serendipity that i walked past today because i've been desperate for some longer sparkly earrings to build up my collection i've got a few but some of them are a bit small i wanted some longer ones and I, but i didn't really want very very cheap ones cheap and nasty ones because they can affect your ears for a start and they always break you know when you compromise on the price you compromise on the quality and they break and they're not especially attractive either and i can't afford to splurge on that kind of thing for the broadcast but it was absolutely perfect today when i walked past and saw that there was a 50 percent sale 
this is their old season stocks i filled my boots and i got five or six pairs yeah five sets and they were all under 10 pound each decent quality all of them were eight or nine quid apart from the diamond wheels that you see here they are part of the new range but even they were only thought 14 pounds so i thought they were really rather reasonable because they're substantial pieces and they're very glittering and they'll add a few different flavors to some upcoming broadcasts and add a bit of razzle dazzle to proceedings if you're a magpie like me you'll know exactly what i'm talking about my dear yes we love those sparkles and those glittery moments don't you my dear well thank you for sharing another glittery moment with me another fruity moment and i look forward to seeing you next time do leave me a comment let me know what you think about harry's controversy and what you think about my tip jar finds thank you again most sincerely to anybody who's chucked me a few dollars to spoil myself or to spoil you because a lot of it goes into what we see on this frame so thank you for helping me populate it. I will see you next time, my lovers. Be good, but not too good. And always be fruity and channel the royal spirit. Ta-ra, my dears, and to the pin.